everyone. Uh, my name is Darion Wiggs. I am the CEO and founder of Wiggs CPA Tax and Accounting. And I wanted to re-record our yesterday's presentation uh, so you can be able to use this as a resource as well as be able to refer to it in the future or share with your family and friends. Again, my name is Darion and I'm happy to do this re-recording for you all to share. So the presentation that we had yesterday on January 5th, 2023 was for tax return updates for individuals. So it's pretty much give you all the updates and changes that you can utilize on your 2022 tax return. So instead of going through an introduction, uh, like I did during the original presentation, I wanna kind of skip over that. Uh, just a big picture, uh, firm was recently launched on October 20th, 2022. And our mission, our goal is essentially to create a bunch of, a ton of free educational resources for you and your family to help you increase your financial literacy and also help teach you about taxes so you can save money and also have a better understanding of your biggest expense. So quick introduction, let's just get straight to the business this time. So the agenda. So today I'll be going over the inflation adjustments, uh, some tax credit changes, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, tax saving tips, as well as deadlines and some tax tips that I think would be helpful to help you all prepare for this upcoming tax season. So let's get started. So the first thing I want to go over today is the inflation adjustments. And I just put the tax bracket here essentially to let you all know the fact that the IRS essentially makes adjustments each and every year to the tax bracket to account for the cost of living here in the US. Obviously, as we all know, during 2022, 2021, inflation was at an all time high compared to recent years. So as a result of that, the IRS wanted to adjust the tax brackets to essentially account for your increase in wages or to pretty much account for the additional cost that they pay to fill your gas tank up or to rent an apartment. So long story short, these numbers are adjusted every single year to account for inflation. Uh, the tax rates are the same, the 10%, 12, 22, et cetera. I just want to put this uh, slide here essentially so you can see where your income is at, uh, what range you fall within, just so you can get a general idea of where you fall in the tax bracket. So give you a second. Next thing I want to go to you all, talk to you all about is the difference between a standard deduction and the itemized deduction. So a standard deduction is an automatic deduction that we all get for filing our tax returns. Without doing anything, you automatically get this deduction to essentially account for the cost of living here in the U.S. So the way it works, basically, if you're single, you get an automatic $12,950 uh, whenever you file your tax returns. If you're head of household, you get an automatic $19,400. Merely file, marry, file it jointly, or if you're a qualifying will do or a qualifying surviving spouse, you will get the $25,900. And this is without doing anything. You literally just have to file a tax return. And what happens is this offsets from your W-2 wages. So if you make $100,000, but you're married and you're filing jointly, your taxable income isn't $100,000. It's the difference between $100,000 and $25,900. So just keep that in mind. And the reason why I brought this up is because uh, I want to explain the difference between a standard deduction and an itemized deduction. So standard deduction, like I mentioned, is an automatic deduction. However, I have a lot of people that come to me after they buy a condo, they buy a home, they start, you know, paying more in taxes and donating to charities. They're like, OK, my tax return is going to be a lot bigger in the sense I'm going to get, get a lower tax liability or I'm going to get a bigger refund just because I own a home. So what I want to take this moment is to explain that that's not always the case. It most likely depends on your situation. So the way it works is e standard deductions, you take that, or if your itemized deductions, so your mortgage interest, your property taxes, your state and local taxes, your medical expenses, your charitable contributions, unless all of the itemized deductions that I just named in combination is higher than your standard deduction, then being a homeowner or paying a lot in taxes throughout the year doesn't really help your tax situation only because every single year that standard deduction is adjusted to account for inflation, to account for the cost of living. So it makes it harder and harder for you to be able to itemize those deductions. So I wanted to put those out there. So for mortgage interest, the max the deduction you can get is $375,000 if you're single, $750,000 married, and property taxes and state and local taxes, you see it's a cap at $10,000, meaning those taxes combined 
are capped at $10,000, which makes it really hard for you to be able to take uh, itemized deductions, but I wanted to kind of explain that difference to you to let you know what your options were. So that's the difference between those two. The next thing is, because this is tax updates, I wanted to pretty much go over what I call the pandemic expired provision. So as we all know, during the pandemic, the IRS and the government essentially gave out a bunch of incentives to small businesses, right? They had the PPP loans, different uh, grants, uh, different retention credits, et cetera. A bunch of money went towards small businesses, but us as individual taxpayers, we, ne we didn't necessarily have all of those incentives because we didn't qualify. However, to account for that, the government expanded and pretty much changed the refundability of a lot of tax credits to essentially help put more money in the eye, in the pockets of the individual taxpayer. So what I mean by that is they adjusted a lot of these credits uh, just so we can get a higher refund to put more money in our pocket, essentially. So I'll, I will elaborate on these in a minute, but I wanted to touch on these really quickly to let you know some of the ones to highlight. So one, the child tax credit decrease. You're no longer getting the 3,600 like you were the year before uh, for children between the age of zero to six. I think it's back to $2,000 and I'll go over that soon. No advanced child tax credit payments. So if you were, got used to receiving 200 to $250 a month, for that six month period per child in 2021 is gonna let you know that you didn't receive it in 2022. That's because the IRS no longer was giving out those payments. So no more advanced child tax credit payments. As far as the child and dependent care credit, that's back to what it was prior to the pandemic, essentially. Uh, the earned income credit is back to uh, pre-pandemic ways as well. And then the two big ones is one, no more stimulus checks. So if you didn't get a stimulus check in 2022, guess what? You're not alone, so don't panic. However, one thing about the stimulus checks, yes, they didn't give out any new ones in 2022. However, if you qualified in 2020 or 2021 and you did not receive those stimulus checks, you can always file one um, and the return too. If you haven't filed at all, you can always re file those returns initially and your tax preparer or whatever software you're using will manually add those tax credits to your return, which should be $600, $1,200, $1,400. So if you qualify, didn't get it, there's still hope. And then the last one's unemployment income. I know during the pandemic, unemployment income, at least in Illinois, was at, it was, I want to say all time high, but it was a lot of money. I know a lot of people were getting a, a huge profit from it. And what the IRS did was they made a, a portion of that untaxable. So I believe it was the first $10,200 was not taxable. However, now that the pandemic is slightly behind us in the eyes of the government, now if you receive unemployment income in 2022, it is 100% taxable. So keep that in mind. If you receive unemployment, report it on your taxes. The IRS knows you received it. So just report it. And hopefully you had taxes withheld. If not, It'll be added to the rest of your income when you'll pay taxes then. So just wanted to point those out. I would elaborate on those shortly. Next thing I want to go over is the tax credits. Now, before I go into the details, I want to break down the concept that helped me personally understand tax credits. So there's two types of tax credits. One is non-refundable. One is refundable. So what does that mean? So you got non-refundable credits, meaning they pretty much do not create a tax refund for you. They'll wipe out your tax liability, but any excess amount will not create a refund. So what does that mean? Let's say you owe the IRS $5,000, that's your tax liability, but you got a $6,000 credit. Your $6,000 credit will wipe out that $5,000 tax liability, but that excess $1,000 you will not get a refund because that's a non-refundable credit. However, with a refundable credit, once your refundable credit exceeds the amounts of taxes you owe, then the access to be running back, well, it can be uh, refunded back to you. So same example, you got a $6,000 credit, you got a $5,000 tax liability, that refundable credit will knock out your tax liability. So now you owe the IRS zero, but because it's refundable, you can get up to a $1,000 refund because you have got a $1,000 extra in that credit. And the reason why I point this out is because what happened during the pandemic is that most of these credits, most of the credits that the individual taxpayer qualifies for was made 100% refundable. So a lot of times what happens is your W-2 checks, 
your W-2 wages, you pay enough taxes every two weeks to wipe out your tax liability. So during the pandemic, I had clients come to me that qualified for the child tax credit payment on $3,000. Uh, basically, they qualified for the credit when they had like over $3,000 in credits to take and because they were all refundable, they owed the IRS zero, but now they have this credit for $3,000. Guess what? They were getting $3,000 refunds per child. So refunds were significantly higher last year, mostly because a lot of the credits were refundable compared to prior years where most of them were non refundable. So I just wanted to point that out. It all makes sense as I go through the tax credits. Okay, now with the tax credit. So the first one is the child tax credit. This credit has been around for the longest. I just want to kind of update you on this. So the first thing is you no longer are getting $3,600 or $3,000 per child. It's basically back to pre, excuse me, excuse me. It's back to pre-pandemic pre ways where now you get $2,000 per child, but under the age of 17. So last year you were getting way more than what you should have gotten. But like I said, a lot of this is because you received advanced child tax credit payments. And also the government wanted to put more money in the hands of the individual taxpayer. So let's keep that in mind. So you get $2,000 per child under the age of 17. Any other call qualifying dependent, any other child that's in school that's over the age of 7, 16, you get $500 per dependent. So I just wanted to point that out. The, the biggest thing is no advanced child tax credit payments. And then this payment is also back to 2000 Another thing is this credit is no longer fully refundable. Like I said last year, if you were eligible for a $3,000 tax credit and you owe the IRS zero, then you were able to get a $3,000 refund. Now, if you owe the IRS $0, and you are eligible for a $2,000 child tax credit payment, guess what? The max refund you can get is $1,500 per child. So slight decrease, but I wanted to point that out uh, just so you can have an understanding and explanation to why your refund isn't as high as it was the year before. Next one I'm going to go over is the child and dependent care credit. So when I first hear this credit, I usually hear child care credit. And what this credit is basically for is to Help account for the cost to take care of your child for outside of elementary school. So let me rephrase that. So it's essentially a credit created to help take care of children under the age of 13 to help take care of them outside of school. So that's you're that talking about babysitters. We're talking about daycares. We're talking about nursery schools. If you have to pay additional money, it's essentially a tax break for the working class to help offset the costs associated with taking care of a child. So that's what I normally hear, and that's what most people hear. However, it is the child independent care credit. Heavy emphasis on dependent, because not only is this for to take care of your children, but if you have a spouse or a child or a relative that you're taking care of over the age of 13 that is physically or mentally incapable of taking care of themselves, well, they also qualify for this credit too as well. So if you're paying a nurse to come home uh, to take care of your family, you got to pay for some additional additions to your home to make it more accessible for them. Some of those expenses may qualify for this credit. So it's not just for children, it's also for dependents who need your support. So now if you got one child, one qualifying child, you can get $3,000. You got one qualifying dependent. That is the max. It was $8,000 in 2021. So as you can see, $5,000 decrease right away. If you got more than one child, okay, if you got two children, three children, four, five, six, the max credit you can get total is $6,000. It was $16,000 in 2021. So as you can see, that's a $10,000 drop. So just keep that in mind. And one important thing to keep here too, last year, this credit was fully refundable in 2021. Now, what this meant is I had clients come to me who owed IRS zero qualify for this $16,000 tax credit, right? And now they were getting $16,000 refunds. So just keep that in mind. That is non-refundable now, meaning it can only help reduce your tax liability, which is fine. But if you have an excess child independent care credit, it will not create a refund for you. It'll just wipe out your tax liability. So there you go. That's kind of the main things on that. Requirements, providers, information. You want to have the EIN, the social security number ready. And you also want to have the amount paid to the person. And one quick tax tip that I gave out uh, during the original presentation is a lot of people only only think they qualify for this credit when they put like a daycare or, you know, a nurse or somebody with a business or like a babysitter that they're paying through the government. But a lot of people don't know that if you have an elder, 
someone who's retired or a child under the age of 18 and their only source of income, if their only source of income is from you as the babysitter, as the, you know, paying them, if their only source of income is from you and it's less than the standard deduction of 12950 well, guess what? Do not be afraid to put their name, their social, and their information on your tax return because not only will it be tax-free income to them, it, you will also be eligible for this tax credit. So just keep that in mind. If you got a family, a friend, someone that you're paying a few hundred here and there, and you know they're part of the less, I want to say less fortunate, but they don't make as much money, then don't be afraid to put their names here. They won't be jeopardized or anything like that. Uh, just because if they make less than a standard deduction, they wouldn't have to pay taxes on that income at all anyway. So let's keep that in mind. Next one is the earned income credit. Whenever you hear this, I want you to think of the basically a tax break for low income workers to help reduce the income, uh, that help reduce their taxable income or essentially help create a refund. The IRS understands that everybody isn't as fortunate to have a huge salary. So as a result, they're like, okay, Instead of making you pay additional taxes, let's give you a credit to essentially help offset your tax liability or even just put more money into your pocket because this is a refundable credit. So one thing to keep in mind that you must have earned income. You can't just be collecting unemployment and then you call up, think you qualify for this credit. It don't work like that. You need to actually be working to qualify for this credit. Now, the minimum age for this credit for someone with no children is 25. It was 19 in 2021, so it is spread it out again, but you may qualify under the age 25 under special circumstances, so please check with your tax preparer. Another thing to keep this in mind so you can get a, a general idea of the income range is just understanding that if your income is somewhere between 16480 if you're single with no kids, or at max 59000 if you have three kids and you're married. If your income falls somewhere between this range, then that, it, the chances are significantly kind of high that you may qualify. So please check uh, the lowest amount of credit you can get if you're single, 25, no kids is 560. It was 1500 last year. So as you can see, that's a huge drop. It's almost $1,000 that you lose out on. And then the max credit slightly went up, but it's 6,935 for folks who, you know, 40, 50 years old, not even that old, but you just have a family, you have kids, but you aren't making more than $60,000. So just keep that in mind. Again, this is refundable. And one important thing to note, let's say if you're 25, you're making 20,000 a year, you have zero kids, but then your friend is 25, making the same amount of money, but she has three kids. Well, your fam friend with the three kids is going to get way more in this credit than you based off how the brackets go. So keep that in mind. It's not based off your income strictly. It's about if you have a qualifying child and basically it's based off your exemption status. So just keep that in mind. The next thing I want to go over is the education tax credits. As we all know, education is expensive here in the U.S. Uh, so the, basically IRS wanted to help kind of reduce the costs of college here in the U.S. by offering these credits to pretty much incentivize us as taxpayers to invest in our education. So first one of the two I want to talk about is the American Opportunity Credit. This credit is for the first four years of college, right? So the moment you graduate from high school, you go to trade school, you go to U of I, you go to, you go to one of these community colleges, you go to school post-secondary, you qualify for this credit for the first four years. This is a max credit of $2,500 and it's partially refundable, meaning the first half, I'm going to say the first $1,500 will wipe out your tax liability and anything excess over that amount, you can get up to a refund of $1,000 max. So just keep that in mind. The next thing is the qualifying expenses for this is tuition. You got your registration fees, you know, additional fees to, to be a student. You also can help pay for books with this credit too as well. Just not room and board or transportation. So just keep that in mind. Room and board and transportation is one of those expenses that you normally don't get for any college savings accounts. So just be mindful of that. The next one is the lifetime learning credit. Now the American Opportunity Credit is for the first four years. Lifetime learning credit is for a limited year. So as long as you want to go to school, you want to get your PhD, you want to get your master's, you're on your fifth year, you, you've been bouncing around going to school throughout your whole life, you may not qualify for the American Opportunity but now you can get this lifetime learning credit for limited years. Max credit of 2000 is not refundable. So it only will wipe out your tax liability, which is still fine. And then the qualifying expenses is the same as 
the American Opportunity Credit, except it doesn't include books and course materials this time, and it also doesn't include room and board. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this one does phase out relatively quickly. So to qualify for this, you need to be making less than ninety thousand dollars, or you need to be making less than hundred. Or you need to be making less than ninety thousand if you're single, less than one hundred and eighty thousand if you're married, following jointly. So just keep that in mind. A lot of these credits do have phase outs, so to not confuse you, I always recommend you to make sure you mention it to your tax preparer or whatever you're using, and to make sure you qualify. So the next one I would love to talk about. So take a quick sip. Now I could talk about the Inflation Reduction Act for five hours. Uh, I've done a presentation on it already, uh, but that's not the purpose of this presentation, right? Purpose of this presentation is to teach you all how the Inflation Reduction Act would have an impact on your life, how it would change your life and help your tax situation as an individual taxpayer. So I'm gonna give you all a quick High level overview this is not to go to the details. This is just a tangible perspective and to help explain the next two tax credits that you are eligible for now. So first, when you hear the Inflation Reduction Act, the first thing to come to mind is inflation. Boom, is to help reduce inflation in the U.S. There we go. Problem solved. However, for the purpose of this conversation, I want you to focus on climate change. And this is why. So this bill, this act, it was the first time in U.S. history that they passed a bill for $369 billion to help reduce carbon emissions by nearly 40% by 20, 2030. Now, this is huge because we always hear about climate change. We always hear about the warm getting up. Don't talk about that. I always hear about the earth, you know, getting warmer and, you know, all this pollution and stuff. We always hear about it, but this is the first time in U.S. history well, we put this significant amount of money, $369 billion, towards making a difference. Now, what does this mean for us as individual taxpayers? Obviously, for larger companies, they're going to get a bunch of grants, credits, rebates, incentives, et cetera, for them to start creating cleaner energy, right? But for us as individual taxpayers, this is going to essentially... The government is basically putting money towards incentivizing us to electrify our lifestyles, electrify our homes, to buy electric vehicles, et cetera. By doing this, is one, is going to lower the energy bills for us U.S. consumers. It's also going to help create more renewable energy. And most importantly, it's going to create more domestic jobs. And what do I mean by that? As we all know, the U.S. tends to outsource a lot of our resources, especially raw materials from different countries, right? So this bill is basically saying, hey, we put a lot of money into this, but in order for you to qualify, you need to start using raw materials. You need to start creating renewable energy. But guess what? Here in North America, also here in the United States of America. So just keep that in mind. That is also for climate change. And this is why it's important to us as individual taxpayers. So one credit uh, that I want to go over with you all is the Energy Efficient Home Improvement Credit. But before I say that, I wanted to say that now there's up to almost $14,000 in rebates and tax credits available to us as individual taxpayers to essentially electrify our homes. The goal is just to help Americans reduce our carbon footprint. So now there's different rebate credit plans essentially operated by the state level. So please check with your state to see what you qualify for. Uh, there's additional grants, not grants, there's additional rebates and credits available to you. The next one, and what I really want to focus on, is the Energy Efficient Home Improvement Credit. So prior to this change in the Inflation Reduction Act on August 16, 2022, there was a $500 credit that essentially said, hey, if you buy, electrify your home, so say you get a heat pump, you get an electric stove, electric wiring, solar panel, right? You were able to get a $500 credit. Problem is that $500 credit was a lifetime credit. I mean, if I got that credit today, that credit is the only time I would ever get that $500 credit for the rest of my life, just 500. So obviously that doesn't incentivize me to spend a bunch of money on electrifying my home and IRS understood that. So now with these additional funds, they basically said, okay, how about this? Every year now, you're going to get a $1,200 annual credit for electrifying your home. So now, each year moving forward, let's just say starting in 2023, 
every time you buy an electric stove and an electric wiring, the next slide to give you more things, a solar panel, like you are eligible now to get this non-refundable credit to help reduce your tax liability just because the U.S. wants us to start doing our part as individual taxpayers to essentially help reduce our, ta uh, help reduce our carbon footprint. So that's something to keep in mind. These are some of the eligible expenses. You got the heat pumps, you got water heaters, you got electric stoves and appliances, you got the electric wiring, solar panels, like the list goes on and on. And I'm pretty sure it's over 100 things that you can do to electrify your home. But now just think of it, hey, you buy something, you are eligible for a rebate, you are eligible for a credit. So just keep that in mind and be mindful. If you're anything like me and you're not too, I want to say, savvy in the sense of figuring out how to electrify your home, there are options. You can schedule a home audit, and this is not the IRS knocking on your door. This is literally you scheduling a home audit with a professional that specializes in helping you improve, uh, aka electrify your home. So you can sit down with a contractor. They can go over details with you and teach you ways that you can do this. Or you can even educate yourself about different equipment that's available by doing research to not only help you get this discount, aka rebate slash credit, but it can also help you do your part and help reduce our carbon emissions. So just wanted to kind of bring that up to you. It's pretty cool in this tag. Uh, it's uh, attached to the Inflation Reduction Act. Next one is my favorite. As someone looking to buy a car within the next five to 10 years, <laughs> uh, this is the electric vehicle incentives. So basically there's a credit called the Plug-In Electric Drive Vehicle Credit, right? So this credit exists for the last couple of years. It was a credit up to $7,500. So you basically get a $7,500 discount off the total purchase price of the car. Not only now, so basically this credit was available for electric vehicles, EV cars, but now, now with the Inflation Reduction Act, you can also get a plug-in hybrid. And it doesn't just have to be a new car. It can also be a used car that's up to two years old. So 2021 to 2022, like if you buy those in 2023, guess what? I believe they qualify. So just look into it. There's a whole list of cars. I mean, thousands of cars that's available uh, that fall within the income ranges. Because if you're getting a Sudan, I believe the price has to be less than 55K and an SUV less than 88K. But there's a whole list of cars that qualify. So just keep that in mind. If you're shopping for a car, you do get $7,500 off the purchase price if that car qualifies. And I say qualify because there are different qualifications. But before I go into that, I want to say one cool thing about the Inflation Reduction Act is prior to that, uh, the U.S. basically looked at companies like Tesla and said, Elon, hey, once you sell more than 200,000 cars, you don't get the tax credit and your consumers don't get this tax credit anymore. You're done. <laughs> Yeah, once you sell, we want you to sell cars, but once you sell more than 200,000, you don't qualify. So as a result, Tesla, GM, and a few other companies like Toyota and Ford already phased out of that 200,000 car limit. So once you sold over, over 200,000, they didn't qualify. However, the Inflation Reduction Act was like, okay, all right, check this out. Starting next year, we're going to get rid of this cap. So now there's no cap, which makes cars like Tesla and cars from GM eligible again to be purchased so you can qualify for this credit. Now, these are the two big things I want you to realize, too, that will help you as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, you don't need to memorize this every single car. There will be a list and more details published on the Internet later. But one, the final assemble of this car must, play take, must take place in the U.S., basically North America. And then also the metals created, the metals used to create this car must also be created here in North America. Now this is huge because as we all know, we outsource a lot of our car materials, our metals, our resources from Asia, you know, in, in different places around the world. So this credit, this act essentially is going to force U.S. companies to start doing things domestically to help create more jobs here, to create more renewable energy here in the US in order to even be qualified for this credit. So just keep that in mind that the car has to be, not I want to say American made, but the final symbol of it, and it has to be made mostly with US metals. And they will give out a more details later, but just be mindful of that, that every car you see on the road will not qualify for this credit. But over time, over the 10 year goal for this incentive, for this Inflation Reduction Act, more cars will qualify as they become more affordable too as well. So that's just those two credits. 
Very cool if you're trying to electrify your home and also do your part. So before I go into some tax saving tips, I wanted to quickly go over some tax adjustments. And we hear tax deductions is not a dollar for dollar reduction in your tax liability. It won't create like a, a, a refund, you know, necessarily. What it does is it, it offsets your taxable income. So if you got a hundred thousand dollar salary and let's say you got the educator expense of three hundred dollars, you will literally be taxed on ninety nine thousand. 970. No, that, the math is wrong. I'm an accountant. I need to fix that. 99,000 is dang, that's a lot of big number. Long story short, you get a $300 deduction in your tax taxable income. So this don't think of it as like really significantly going to impact your tax return. And I'm going to do that math once I can think straight. So basically you get an educator expense if you are a teacher of $300 per teacher in your household. So if you buy an additional supplies and you're your kindergarten teacher, like this is when this adjustment kicks in. So you are eligible for this credit. Uh, same thing if your spouse is two, you get 300 each. Student loan interest, that is a big one too as well. You get two, you get $2,500 as a credit, uh, as an adjustment, sorry about that, to offset your taxable income. And that is if you're single and you make less than $85,000, you're eligible. And if you're married, following joint me, you make less than $175,000, you're also eligible to get a partial amount of this uh, adjustment to your tax return. And I know right now the White House uh, currently extended student loan payments uh, the, as far as interest until June 30th, 2023. But just be on the lookout for updates uh, once the loss, the pending lawsuits are figured out. But just know if you are paying student loan interest, then at some point in the future, you will be able to use that to offset your W-2 wages. Next one is the health savings account. Uh, this one is popular, especially for us accountants that we know about because it offers a triple tax benefit. So before I go into that, just know that if your annual deductible, if you're single is over $1,400, or if you're married, filing jointly, and it's over $2,800, then this is when you qualify for this health savings account. Excuse me. So the way it works is if you qualify, this gives you a triple tax benefit, and triple tax meaning one, you get a deduction for investing in this account. So now you get a deduction of $3,650 3, to offset your W-2 wages by having this account. So let's say you put that amount in there, right? And then any earnings that you get from this account, because you're putting these funds into the stock market or index fund, et cetera. So let's say you put 3,000 in there, right? At the end of 2023, you got $4,000 in that account. That $1,000 difference, that capital gain, guess what? It is tax-free income if when you withdraw from that account, you're using it to pay for eligible medical expenses. And I mean, that's your going to the hospital, uh, that's meaning the ER, regular checkups, prescriptions, et cetera. As long as you're using the funds, the growth in this health savings account for medical expenses, that's a triple tax benefit. Nope, you get a deduction when you put money in, it grows tax-free and withdrawals are tax-free as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. The next one I want to go over is IRA contributions. A lot of W-2 employees, especially with the higher paying jobs, have 401k plans. So obviously you get a, a deduction for that too, to offset your W-2 wages on your, you know, every week when you, you know, every two weeks on payroll. But what I'm referring to is the $6,000 contributions that you can make outside of that 401k plan. Now, when you hear this and you think of it from an adjustment standpoint, just think of it as it's being mostly for what the IRS would consider people on kind of the lower income range. It is more to incentivize folks who don't make as much money to incentivize them to invest in other sources to invest in retirement, aka a traditional IRA. So if you invest in a traditional IRA and you make less than 68,000 if you're single, or if you make less than 129,000 total if you're married, then guess what? You can also get a just additional adjustment on your tax return to account for your contributions to this account. Now they also have a retirement savings credit too as well, but that's for low income taxpayers for people who don't make much at all. And they also, in most cases, don't have a 401k plan. So not only do they get this adjustment, but they can also get a tax credit. Uh, so uh, please check with your tax preparer to see if you qualify for that. Now that's enough about the tax tips per se. Uh, I wanna kind of go now uh, about some tax saving tips. 
These are the credits you were eligible for. But now I want to go into the uh, the good details of what I'm super happy to share with you all. So if you haven't listened to this point, this is the time to tap in and focus uh, and just hear me out. So I'd like to give you a time to get your pen. All right, seems like you're ready. So the first tip is the tax saving tip that I want to talk about is to invest in real estate. Now, there's a reason you always hear this. There's a reason why the rich don't pay taxes. It's because they invest in real estate not only to create an extra passive income source, but they also invest in real estate to take full advantage of what is called depreciation. And for those who don't know, depreciation is essentially an invisible expense that accounts for the deterioration of your building. It basically allows you to deduct the total purchase price of that building over 27.5 years. So if you purchase a building or a home or rental property, et cetera, for $100,000, every year you get a 27 point you get a 27.5 basically you take the hundred sorry about that you can take a hundred thousand you divide it by 27.5 and that is your annual deduction every single year right so the way it works is and to give you an example is a lot of times you buy a rental property right and it produces a, a cash flow right a couple hundred dollars a few thousand depending on how how much you make right and i say cash flow i mean that's your income after you collect rent pay mortgage interest property tax repairs etc you normally have a cash flow that you get taxed on. However, yes, you have a cash flow, but for tax purposes, once you take into consideration depreciation, it creates a loss on your tax return. So that's what a lot of wealthy folks know. So yeah, you make a couple hundred, a couple thousand a year, but imagine if you bought a $500,000 building or even a million dollar property, and then you divide that total purchase price by 27.5, that's a huge deduction. Every single year, when I say deduction, this is not money coming out of your pocket. This is a deduction. This is an incentive provided for the government for you to invest in real estate. And what this does is it creates a loss on your tax return. And since you are a W-2 employee, these losses, if you play your cards right and you become a real estate professional by investing in a lot of properties, you can use up to 100% of those losses to offset your W-2 wages, to wipe out your tax liability completely or even create a refund because you already paid taxes, aka you overpaid. So that is something to keep in mind. Like I said, you got to work up to that point. You need to be classified as a real estate professional and I as IRS. However, if you're just getting started, you're making less than $100,000. Your max loss that you can use to offset income from other sources is 25 k And then it starts to phase out You know, uh, between $100,000 and 150000 So just keep that in mind that real estate is the way to go in terms of using it as a tax saving strategy. Number two, this is my favorite for me personally. I want you all to learn how to invest in yourself. And I say this because imagine if you started working harder on yourself than you do on your job. See, what happens is a lot of us work eight hour shifts, 10 hour shifts, 12 hour shifts, 14 hour shifts for somebody else, right? And it's common. I've done it. I've done it. You know, you're doing it now. Like, and it's perfectly fine. But I just want to change your mindset and always encourage my friends, my family, clients, et cetera. Imagine if you put that same amount of energy, that same work ethic, and building yourself and working on your dreams and working on your goals. Imagine if you just did that for yourself. You can get a lot done. I'm pretty sure you get a lot done because the truth is, and this is not me saying invest in yourself and quit your job. This is me saying invest in, the, in yourself so you can join the right team. See, the problem is the tax code was not created for W-2 employees, right? The truth is the tax code was created for entrepreneurs and for investors. So in order for you to start winning in taxes, in order for you to keep your tax liability as low as possible, or even create a huge reap, in order for you to start winning in taxes, you need to join the winning team. And the winning team is business owners and investors. So this isn't me telling you to quit your job. This is me telling you to join the winning team by investing in yourself, educating yourself about different ways that you can start investing. You know, you can start a side gig or even better yet, Figure out a way, educate yourself and figure out a way on how to turn your side hobby into a business so you can essentially make your life activities, your lifestyle deductible. So I'll go over that next. 
This is what I'm really excited to share with you all about. And this is essentially turning your hobby into a side business. So check this out. The IRS basically states, right, that the moment, the moment your hobby or any activity that you perform, if the intent of that is to make a profit, guess what? You're considered a business owner in the eyes of the IRS, right? And I'm going to say that again in another way, just so it can resonate with you. The moment you decide that your hobby or whatever you're doing is going to be to make a profit, once you have that intent in the eyes of the IRS, you're considered a business owner. Now, what does that mean? That means that moving forward, anything that's ordinary and necessary for you to complete your hobby, for you to complete your business, it becomes a tax deduction. And that essentially means that now you're able to use those expenses to offset your W-2 wages. So check this out. When you're a W-2 employee, you don't, you, let's say you got a hobby, right? You're a photographer. You enjoy doing it. I, I'm going to be a photographer. I use that example as me. I love buying cameras. I love taking pictures of friends and family to help them put a new IG pitch up there. Uh, I've hosted a few weddings and since where I was a photographer. Uh, I love traveling. I go to Paris to, to blog and to take pictures. Uh, like I said, I, I got travel back and forth. I got hot flights, hotels. I got all these expenses that I was going to pay for anyway because it's a hobby, right? Guess what? W-2 employee, that doesn't matter. You know, you're using your after-tax money. It doesn't help you. But the moment, the moment you decide that you want to change your hobby into your side business and have the intent to make a profit. And I'm not saying six figures. I'm saying the moment you decide that you want to join the winning team and you have the intent to make your hobby profitable, now all those expenses become deductible. So let's just say I'm making about $100 a month for the year, right? That's $1,200 a year. I'm not saying you need to be a millionaire to do this. I'm literally just throwing numbers out. So I say 1,200. And for simplicity purposes, let's just say I made $1,000 last year, right? It's my business now, you know? I made $1,000. I just brought a new camera, $1,000 with lenses. Uh, I got a backdrop. I got a, you know, my miles to go back and forth. I just flew to Atlanta. So my flight, my, uh, my hotel, my meals, everything, uh, pretty much anything that I need to be a photographer, comes out to about ten to fifteen thousand dollars in expenses, right? But now, since I have a business, those expenses can offset my thousand dollar income. So, for tax purposes, I got thousand dollars in income. I got ten thousand dollars in losses. Well, that's a nine thousand dollar loss. So, hear me out. I say you make six figures in corporate America, right? You're making a thousand, a hundred thousand, right? You pay taxes on a hundred thousand every two weeks. You pay cousin FICA. Uncle Sam, state and local taxes, et cetera, right? You pay your taxes on 100K. You have no option, no choice, right? But now I have a business. So I pay taxes on 100,000, but I have a loss in my photography business of 9,000, right? So pay taxes on 100K, but my taxable income is really 91,000. So what happens? Now I'm getting a refund from the excess amount that I paid. That additional 9000 I paid on, I'm getting a refund. It's either A, it's going to lower your tax liability if you still owe the IRS, or you do this the right way, it's going to create a refund for you. It's going to maximize your refund. It's going to put more money back in your pocket. And now you can use those additional funds to invest back in your business, aka your hobby slash your lifestyle, or you can essentially help reduce your tax liability. So I just wanted to point this out because a lot of you, have hobbies, you have things that you do that you don't realize that you can turn that into a side business. You like, I put a bunch of things out there. Some people blog, some people are graphic designers, some people are artists. You love cooking. You're a photographer, you make videos on YouTube, you're a comedian, you do stand up shows, you're a promoter, uh, you're, you're a barber, you like cutting hair, you babysit, you play video, like all this stuff. Essentially, the moment you have the intent to make it profitable, you can turn this into a business. And I see a lot of people do this. I'm not just making this up. I got clients when I first started doing taxes, making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, coming in with a t-shirt business with a twenty thousand dollar loss. <laughs> you know, I'm like, how are you doing this? I had questions. I looked at their tax returns for before I was born, and they've been doing it their entire lives. And that that's just is perfectly legal. And I'm not telling you to take a thousand, you know, a hundred thousand in losses. I'm literally just saying, if you follow the tax code, you read the tax code and you create a hobby and you essentially turn that into a business, 
then you can make your entire lifestyle deductible. Because like I said, with photography, I was going to pay for those things anyway. But now that I properly incorporated my business or changed my mindset and acted as if I was a business owner by separating my business and my personal life, guess what? Everything becomes deductible. So not sure when you're watching this. If you're watching this before January 12th, 2023, that was a shameless plug for my event next week. I am basically walking you through the steps to basically start a business, how to do the bookkeeping for a business, stay compliant with the IRS, and also teach you how to capture these tax deductions that will ultimately help you join the winning team, help maximize your refund, and help reduce your tax liability for the rest of your life. So that event is next Thursday. Uh, reach out to me if you have questions about joining that. That is January 12th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Central Time. But this is amazing, y'all. This is the easiest way, the most efficient way, and mostly my favorite way to reduce your tax liability. So that was on that. Uh, now we're going to get back to some tax tips because I know tax season is coming up. Before I go into this, I want to say the deadline for your 2022 tax return. The deadline is April 18th, 2023. W-2s and everything will be issued by the end of this month, meaning that every employer is required to send W-2s and 1099s to the IRS by the end of January. So you should be getting your W-2s within the next month or so from this day. So as a result of that, I want to give you five quick tax season tips to help you prepare. One, gather all your financial documents. Never change. You got a W-2. You invest in Coinbase, cryptocurrencies, or Robinhood, or E-Trade, anything like that. Get those 1099s ready. Get your charitable contributions, all of that. Get all that financial information ready to go. Number two, consolidate your personal information for your family uh, or even qualifying relatives. You can take care of your cousin all, all year and you're tired of them not paying rent. Or you just you got a grandparent or a parent and you want to follow them as a dependent, start gathering their information too. It makes the process a lot faster. Uh, pull your IRS transcripts is number three. A lot of people don't know this, but like I mentioned, all employers are required to send 1099s and W-2s to the IRS by the end of January. And what the IRS does, it, it creates a transcript for you, which shows all the income that you received that year in the eyes of the IRS. So if you don't know how much you received, you don't know how many W-2s were reported or how many how much income is reported on your behalf and your name and your social security number, go pull your IRS transcript on the irs.gov uh, slash get transcript and it'll show you all the income that you need to report on your tax return. Because at the end of the day, when you file the IRS, we do a cross-reference to kind of see if you actually filed everything that was reported. And one cool thing about this is if you lost your W-2s in 2019, 2018, 2020, uh, and you haven't been able to file, you can always just pull your IRS transcript and give that to your tax preparer and we can mail those tax returns in for you. So there's always an option. Number four, find a qualified tax preparer. And the reason why I say this is because, yes, if you just have a W-2, use TurboTax. I did it. I'm a fan of it. Boom. Problem is, once you have a W-2, once you start investing, once you own the property, once you have a family, once you qualify for all of the tax deductions and adjustments that I just mentioned, TurboTax won't tell you all that. If you click the wrong box in the beginning, or if you don't know what you're eligible for, they're keeping that money, not you. So make sure the moment your situation becomes complex, that's when you want to invest in having a qualified tax professional on your team, because the biggest tax that we all pay is the tax of not knowing, and my mentor will call it the ignorance tax. So just keep that in mind, people, that once your family start growing and once your tax situation becomes a little bit more complicated, it's worth investing in the tax professional. And lastly, file as soon as possible to avoid delays. Truth is, the IRS is significantly behind because of the pandemic. So please be, pay <laughs> please be patient with them. They are behind and their systems are out of date. So you want to file as quickly as possible to ensure that your refund comes on time. So that's pretty much it. Uh, that was a quick 50-minute spill. I want to put my contact information here. Uh, my website is at wigcpa.com. Email there, cell phone. Uh, follow me on IG. It's a new account, but I, my goal is to essentially create free educational resources, not only to help you with taxes, but to help improve and increase everyone's financial literacy. So please check me out. And if you're watching this before the 12th of January, uh, text uh, business to my number, and I'll definitely help you get registered for that event. 
But yeah, uh, any questions, you need anything from me, uh, we focus mostly on businesses, but we also have a couple spots for individual tax preparation. So if you're looking for someone new or if you just have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm really passionate about teaching. I'm passionate about learning and I would love to help all of you too as well. Save as much money as possible and help you accomplish your financial goals and your financial dreams. So thank you. I hope you all have a great day. And thanks again for tuning in to a presentation by Wigs CPA Tax and Accounting. Thank you.